This is a tutorial on the residential listing agreement, CAR form RLA. Now, this form comes as a bundle. It starts with the real estate agency relationship disclosure. It's a two page form. You simply put in the name or names of the seller here, and then your brokerage name, brokerage license number, your name as an agent, your particular license number, the date, and you're going to sign here. The second page, you do nothing. There's nothing to do. It's all boilerplate text. You'll go on to a fair housing advisory form. It's two pages. And the seller is just going to, the name will be here. When you enter this and it forms, the name will appear here. And I have Sally Seller as a sample. Sally would then sign right there and date right there. And you'll continue on. Possible representation of more than one seller uh, or buyer. That you'll notice these these are included in a in a purchase agreement bundle as well. So some of these forms overlap. I guess better to have more than not enough. So here you're going to put the seller's name, sign, your firm, brokerage name, brokerage license number. You're going to uh, excuse me. That's for the buyer, um, and this will be included when you get an offer. But if for good measure, you fill it out when you do the listing agreement. And, and so you're going to put your brokerage name, brokerage license number, your license number below. You're going to put your name and sign and date. Wire fraud advisory, same idea, disclosure. Client's going to put their name, sign, and date. And finally, we arrive at the residential listing agreement. You're going to put the date that you prepare the form here. That's the date that you draft it the name of your client, the name of your brokerage. Sometimes agents write a broker's name or their name or a team name. It needs to be the company name that is on the corporate license with the Department of Real Estate. Beginning a particular date, ending a particular date. If you do not put a beginning and ending date, it nullifies or can nullify or invalidate this form. Sometimes I've seen agent in the past, agents in the past that have left this blank because they're on a very friendly basis with the client, that's not acceptable. This, there must always be a start and end date on a listing agreement. Property address, name of the city, county, zip code, parcel number, which can be found on Realist, tax records, an old listing, or the county assessor's website. And we go down here to the listing price. This is a starting listing price. There'll be, there can be reductions, there can be an increase, but there needs to be something starting here. So you'll put $800,000. Well, I, and I just put that as a sample number. It can be, of course, you know, whatever it needs to be. Listing terms almost always left blank. In case there's some special unique term that's not already addressed in here, you can put it there. All right, compensation to broker. So you'll start with, I'm putting 6%. So if we're, if we're all using theoretical numbers, might as well start with the full 6%, right? So I put 6% here. Now, a very, very common mistake agents make is they put half of the number uh, that they're collecting in total. Here's an example. Let's say you are a listing agent and you're going to get 3% and you're going to offer the buyer's agent 3%. Agents often will put the 3% they're charging here and then the other 3% down below, down here. That's incorrect. 3A, this line, this is the gross amount of commission being charged. Keep in mind, the listing broker is collecting the gross commission from the seller. And then the listing broker then <clears throat> splits off a portion of that gross commission and gives it to the buyer's agent. So. It's not that the seller is paying the, the buyer's agent directly and the listing agent directly. It's that this form is the document that charges a seller to sell their home. <clears throat> and then then the, the listing agent then pledges a portion of what they collect to a buyer's agent, typically advertised on the MLS. So um, it, it's important to make that distinction. So we'll put 6% here. If there was a flat fee, you could put it here. It's. I, I think it's wise for an agent to put like a transaction coordinator fee or another broker fee. If you're with our company, I would say put some fee here and, we, and we'll deduct it from the flat fee that the, of the brokerage fee, which saves you money. I've seen some agents that will just pass on their entire brokerage fee. For example, we've, we've 
charge a flat fee in our brokerage. And <clears throat> agents will add that, that fee here and pass it on to their client. And then they truly keep every penny of the commission, 100% commission. This part's blank. I should have written in uh, 90 days. But this, this protects you um, in case someone that has entered the property during the listing period and then comes uh, after the fact and and make, wants to make an offer. because So imagine this. Imagine you have a listing for 90 days. and Or let's, let's not confuse why I'm putting 90 days here. Let's say you have a listing for six months, no offers, but a lot of showings, a lot of people come through. Then right after your listing expires, a buyer that had that had come through a couple of times and was interested finally makes an offer. Well, you want to make sure that that you're involved, that you get the to represent the seller because it was your efforts of marketing a property and making it available that that uh, brought that buyer. That buyer discovered the property, was able to view it because you you are actively marketing it as a listing agent. If you put 90 days here, this protects you. If, you, if, if someone has an objection for some weird reason, I, I couldn't imagine why, make sure there's at least 30 days here because this is the period that you're protected after your listing period ends uh, in case if someone comes back and, and someone comes back from when it was listed with you and makes an offer after your listing ends. So very important to put some amount of days here, preferably 90 all right, there's so much boilerplate text here, and a lot of it is to basically give instructions to the parties about recourse or expectations of duties. Uh, there's no point in going into it. I mean, you can read it if you really want, but this kind of a lot of this verbiage here actually protects an agent from a, a seller trying to sabotage a transaction. And now down here, 3D, this is very important. This number that you put here is how much you're offering the buyer's agent. So this is this number here is deducted from this number up here. This is 3A is the gross commission you charge. 3D is the amount that you're pledging to split off to pay a buyer's agent. Now, the mistake I, I see people make is that if you know they're thinking, hey, the listing brokerage gets 3%, the buyer's brokerage gets 3%. What you know, so they'll put 3% here and 3% there. The way this form is drawn that these cancel each other out. If you have 3% here and you're just thinking, oh, well, this is for the listing company and this is for the selling brokerage, selling meaning the representative of the buyer, that's a problem because at that point, you're not charging anything. You're collecting only 3% and then you're, uh, and then you're giving that 3% to the buyer's agent. So when I say not charging something, it's because there's no, if this number matches this number, there's no amount for the listing brokerage. You're giving everything away that you're charging on line 3A. So keep in mind, this is the gross number that you are charged as the listing broker to collect from the, the seller. And this is the amount of that number above that you're giving to the buyer's agent. I just want to stress that. It's very important. You do not want to have to. You, you do not want to have to manage a dispute where you've done this wrong, and it turns out that you uh, are entitled to zero as a listing broker because everything you charge goes to the buyer's broker. All right, and let's see. So more boilerplate uh, verbiage here. You know, some of these lines. I mean, these are all special circumstances. So if you have some sort of weird circumstance, like like some seller says, oh, well, I was doing this thing with this other agent and they have an active listing agreement, but I'm trying to cancel, but they don't return my call. I mean, just run it by your broker and your broker will tell you where you need to add some information here. But this is not standard stuff. I mean, people skip through this. I mean, most of this is left blank. If there's this additional item included or excluded, you'll put it here. If there's our least items, you put it here. You can just annotate it. Even if you don't, it's not a big deal. Ultimately, this form is about, this is a, a an authorization to, to or essentially it's a, it's a contract to hire a brokerage to market and sell your property for a commission. That's what this form is in essence. So there's just a lot of window dressing on it as well. Uh, let's see, MLS. Um, you know, we'll make a separate video about clear cooperation, but basically pocket listings are uh, are, are virtually obsolete per uh, NAR policy. 
So um, you'll, this is just basically telling the seller you, you're, you by by if your agent tries to talk you out of using the MLS, you're losing exposure. That's what all this is. So that's why people are initialing this box here. But basically, and there's the coming soon status, meaning if it, when you take a listing, you're supposed to put that listing on the MLS right away, right away. And if your client is telling you, look, it's not ready, I'm having repairs that aren't finished yet, or the photographer won't come for a week and I want to wait, or whatever the reason is, that's unacceptable in terms of being an excuse to not put it on the listing, uh, excuse me, put the listing on the MLS. But... Uh, um, in the MLS and their effort to be to keep it reasonable, they just do the coming soon uh, status, so that you as an agent you have to put that listing on the MLS because you're obligated. But if it's not ready because whatever is going on with the condition, it's not cleaned or whatever, then uh, you put it in the coming soon status. That's basically a hold status prior to going active. That's it, it's a longer topic, and I've done a podcast episode all about this extensively that you can find on our website, balboateam.com, that explains uh, clear cooperation and your obligation as an agent. This is all stuff that you can just kind of breeze right through, to be honest. I mean, if I was filling a listing out for a client right now, I'd breeze through here unless there was some sort of special scenario that needed to be addressed. Uh, if there's a... Um, if there is a yeah, so if there's a replacement property involved, if there's a uh, a, a, a trust involved, it, and additional terms, these blank spaces, anything you want, you can write in here. Any random thing that you feel wasn't properly addressed by all this template verbiage, you can write in, in the, on these lines. Mediation, so that it doesn't turn into a lawsuit if something goes wrong. Representative capacity. Does the seller hold title to the home as an LLC or as a as a, a trustee of a trust? If the home's held in a trust or, or some sort of corporation or an LLC, you'll need to check this box. You'll need to do a representative capacity seller disclosure. And that form is going to show who the individual signer is, their relationship to the entity that owns the home. Because... If this is an entity, if this is owned by XYZ LLC, instead of seeing Sally Seller right here, you're going to see XYZ LLC. If it's owned by a trust, you'll see the Smith Family Trust dated 1999 or whatever, however the trust reads. And then you can't have someone, sometimes I see people make this mistake where they have, let, let's say it's an LLC. I'll see a signature and the signature is XYZ LLC. And that's usually done through DocuSign because that, 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 it's easy for that mistake to happen through there. You cannot sign a company name. There's, that's no, there's no such thing. You can't sign Smith Family Trust. You can't sign XYZ Homes Inc. or whatever the company name. There must be a, an individual person that's an authorized signer, authorized to sign on behalf of the entity. And that's where this RepCap form, the RCSD form, that designates who's authorized to sign on behalf of the entity. The entity name would be here, and the, uh, the individual is going to sign here and identify themselves on that, uh, on that separate form. All right, and so because a signature needs to be like Jane Doe, and it could be Jane Doe comma trustee or Jane Doe and a president of the corporation she uses to buy and sell homes or wh whatever it is, but... Um, Jane must sign Jane Doe. She can't sign the corporate name. She, you know, the seller must be a, a, a individual person uh, that um, signer, authorized signer. All right, your real estate brokerage firm. You're going to sign here. Seller advisory, advi advising the seller in terms of duties and diligence. This is uh, to mitigate liability, of course. More disclosures, the better. Seller's going to initial. Seller's going to sign. You're going to sign. Just when you thought it was done, we now have a newer form, California Consumer Privacy Act Advisory. And the buyer or the seller's going to sign here and date. And that is it. We have finished the residential listing agreement and the forms that go along with it. I hope you found this helpful and thank you for watching.